Thank you for listening to Beth Harashim, the House of Artisans podcast. Here is this week's message from Chris John Otto. This is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning in verse 25 of the 10th chapter. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, whatever thou spendest more. When I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showeth mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I want to share a little bit about getting a kingdom perspective, especially in the times that we're living in. It's really important to have a kingdom perspective. One of the interesting things about this story is that there's a lot of things that the Gentile reader will miss because there's a lot going on here that it's, it's particularly Jewish. So what's going on with this? This all, it, it puts this scribe, this lawyer, in a particularly negative light. But it's in the context, it wasn't as negative as it appears. Because Jews argue as a point of virtue and negotiate. There's a constant negotiation going on. If you're a law scholar of the law, what this person here who has spoke to Jesus was a yeshiva boy, probably younger but he was a scholar in of the torah and so he's asking jesus a question about and jesus answers right he, he quotes leviticus chapter 17 which is the heart of the law the young rabbi he would have been a young rabbi so so this is a conversation between two rabbis and this dickering that goes back and forth is is not only acceptable, it's expected. Because remember, when we come back to truth. When you're Jewish, truth is the, is the tension between two different points of view. And you work that out in community. The Jewish idea is that everybody doesn't agree on everything. That's a, that's a bonus if you don't agree on everything. So the lawyer it says here to justify himself. Now remember, this is Luke. So Luke's a Gentile. So he doesn't intrinsically understand this. Luke says that the lawyer to test Jesus, to justify himself. What's really going on here is the lawyer is trying to one up Jesus a little bit 
but not to not to shame Jesus, but to kind of have this engagement. That's what's going on here. He's having this engagement. And he says, who is my neighbor? Because if you're Jewish, your neighbor is a Jew. Not anybody else. Not the Goyim, not the nations. They're not your neighbors in this world and in the world that we live in today. The Jews had understood the Torah required them to take care of each other, but not anyone beyond that. So Jesus takes this and he he turns the whole thing on its head. First, there's a priest. Now, this is something that doesn't say in the text, but the reason the priest, the real reason the priest didn't touch this man is if he's a priest and he's on his way to Jerusalem, he has to be ritually clean. He can't touch a bleeding man. Or he can't do his job. And if you're a priest and you're on your way to Jerusalem, that means that the lot has fallen on you. And if you do this, if you take care of this man, they are going to be shorthanded at the temple when you get there. Because you're unclean. Now the Levite, that's another story. And this is where it does become what the conventional mind says. Oh, well, he's a hypocrite because there's no, he has no ritual cleanliness obligation. He could very well have stopped. And this is what Jesus often does when he teaches. He, he ups the ante, or he keeps upping the ante. But uh, so everyone's a bit shocked that the Levite doesn't stop. He was listening. And then here's the punchline. It's the Samaritan. So we could turn this story all different ways. We could say, well, he's in Israel now and a Palestinian came along, Arab. We could uh, go to Scotland and we could say a posh uh, Englishman from Eton. We could go to Ireland and we could say Brit did it. And here we could say an Irish person did it. There's always somebody somebody doesn't like. There's always somebody somebody doesn't like. And so think of the person that you like the least on earth. That's who Jesus said came along. And and don't lie to me. You have somebody that you don't like because you're a human being. You have somebody that you have a prejudice about because that's the nature of humanity, right? Unless one of you is the holy saint and I should kiss your ring, but (laughs) somebody out here is a holy relic. He had compassion on him. And Yeshua says that the most important thing here Is not keeping the letter of the law. That's an earthly perspective. The kingdom perspective is completely different. And this rabbi, and and this is why he's not a bad guy. Because if he was a bad guy, like some of the ones at the end of John's gospel, who are unwilling to ever change, and this is where, where Luke's Greek perspective doesn't give you the full picture. But this is a rabbi, and he realized he, that he, this is truth. That's why he didn't ask another question. We've come to truth. This is truth. He knew it. Isn't that an interesting process that's happening here? I'm doing a dangerous thing today. And I'm going to teach on a topic, kind of jumping off this, that doesn't, isn't obviously in the text. But we have to get a kingdom perspective. We have to keep a kingdom perspective. And increasingly, 
you know, Suzanne and I, we had an interesting interchange yesterday about guns in America. And I explained to her why Americans are so uh, vehement about this and explain the history behind it. And she was really, couldn't quite accept it, which is understandable because she's coming from a completely different grid. There's nothing wrong with that. She has her Slovak grid. I have my American grid. American through and through, really. But, but, they're, they're two different grids. So often we bring to the scripture and we bring to our spiritual life this earthly grid, this Christian worldly grid, this secular worldly grid, whatever grid you're working with. And the kingdom grid is a different grid. Uh, you've heard me say this in the past. You know, I worked in the big Toronto revival conference thing, you know, for years. And because I heard prophetic people coming through all the time, week after week, sometimes there was seasons like that. They all had the same words. This is in the late 1990s. And there were two words that I heard, two words I heard again and again. Uh, God is going to shake all things that can be shaken. And you name the names. I heard them say this. John Paul Jackson, Bob Jones, Mike Bickle, Jill Austin, Cheyenne, uh, uh, and a whole slew of more names said that, had that same word. God is going to shake all that can be shaken. And then the second one was, the light was going to get brighter and the dark was going to get darker. We're living in a great upheaval right now and those words i really I, I i'm i'm confident now those words are coming to pass and you know we were given time to prepare for those words and for me it was the preparation was learning how to listen to the lord and what he tells you and walking in a kingdom perspective whether it feels good or not a lot of times walking in a kingdom perspective does not feel good. And, and this is what we have to keep in mind. Uh, God is going to shake all that could be shaken. The light is going to get lighter and the dark is going to get darker. The other word uh, that I received earlier this year was chaos was about to happen this year. But the Lord was in the chaos. Boy, there's a lot of chaos. When I landed on Wednesday and found out that Tuesday night while I was in the air, Boris Johnson's cabinet had resigned and uh, that he resigned by Thursday, Wednesday afternoon. I was barely, I've just got to where I was staying when he did that. It was about the same hour that I got to Sheena's house that he resigned. And I said, well, this is really interesting. And several people texted me from both sides of the Atlantic. And I said, well, I guess my, my visits to the UK aren't very good for prime ministers. Because I recall one of these trips that Theresa May got it uh, on a, you know, at a bad, you know, at the beginning of one of these trips. And people said, well, you're here for, at a very tr tumultuous time. Well, every trip to the UK has been rather tumultuous. We've had Brexit. We've had the largest prime minister election since Margaret Thatcher. We've had one go south badly. It's very interesting. We have to make a choice to see our world from a kingdom perspective. We have to make a choice to see our world from a kingdom perspective. This is why politics can be so tricky. Because so often politics are not kingdom at all. Just because I feel right about something doesn't mean it's the kingdom. Yeah, there are some things that are very clear. Kingdom, you know, God's will or not. 
But human government rarely is the instrument that God uses for his will. Throughout history, uh, often God's will is worked out in spite of human government. So the scribe, he comes to Jesus with an earthly perspective. And the questions he's asking are very earthly. So when we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about the God's perspective, heaven's perspective. When you have an earthly perspective, and I've taught on this before, so some of this is going to sound familiar. Earthly perspectives are problem focused. Whatever you look at gets bigger. So if you look at problems, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. You look at the bank account, you're going to get depressed. No matter how much money you have, you'll never have enough. It's really true. And it's mammon. It's the spirit of mammon. No matter how much money, and I've had very full bank accounts, and I've had rather empty ones. If you look at those bank accounts, you're always going to feel uneasy. There's never enough. Do you know how you deal with that? You give something away. You know, I knew an old Baptist preacher. You've heard me say this. He had a bank account called Pennies for Jesus. There's a poverty spirit right there. But he said, I give something away every day. And he wrote people checks out of this Pennies for Jesus bank account. Sometimes they were very small checks. They still wrote them. And he gave something away every day. And there's power in that when we give things away because it disarms this poverty thing. So, uh, one, you can't be po problem focused. Interesting thing is when you have an earthly perspective and you become problem focused, you come up with a problem, you come up with solutions that create two more unexpected problems. And you're doing it this way. I saw an interesting quote this week from Thomas Sowell, who is not someone I generally would quote. Uh, he was an academic, and he said that the problems we're facing today are yesterday's solutions. Wow. The problems we're facing today are yesterday's solutions. And there's wisdom in that. There's wisdom in that. Second, when you have an earthly perspective, you're effort-based. You have to try harder. You have to make something happen. You have to do it in your own effort. And of course, the problems are beyond your scope and the effort is beyond your scope. So it will bring you to despair. The earthly perspective will always bring you to despair. I think that the motto of this perspective is, how is this going to work out? or I just have to figure this out. Those are the two. It always turns, you always go back to the works of the flesh when you have an earthly perspective. What are the works of the flesh? Anger, rage, malice, envy, strife, political spirit, sexual immorality, witchcraft, sorcery, ad nauseum, murder, all those things that St. Paul talked about. Those, those things are the product of the earthly perspective. And last but not least, and I think this is the most important one we need to talk about, is the emotions. When you have an earthly perspective, you are going to have an emotional response. This is one of the reasons we, I had this great dinner last night at Susanna's house, and we were talking about this, that I, off most media, very little news, and I'll tell you the main reason why I'm off that is because I get angry. Because I'm an Anglo-American from New England, I have, a, I stuff my anger then and it comes out other places because I'm not allowed to show any emotions because I grew up with a stiff upper lip. And so you, but it comes out, you know, and it comes out, you know, all over the place. And when you, when you have that emotional response, you're not in the kingdom. You're ap operating out of your emotions. God can do nothing through human anger. 
God can do nothing through human anger. Those of us in our prayer group, we know that if we have anger or rage in any place, that blocks the flow. So you have to keep that anger in check. So the kingdom perspective is often counterintuitive. Just the opposite of what we think is the natural way to do things. I guess it makes sense because it's a supernatural way. So as I said in the beginning, God is in the chaos right now. Everything that's going on in the world that seems crazy, the Lord is behind it. Because he who sit, the kings of the earth rise up and the nations take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. But he who sits in heaven laughs. And I think that's what's going on. We're reaching an end of an era of the generation of the sons of Eli. These are people who did everything in their own strength. So it's no surprise that, that God couldn't use Boris Johnson. Or a whole bunch of others. It, he's not unique. Could spend a half an hour listing people right now. So let me tell you some stories about getting a kingdom perspective. As you know, the last 14 or 16 months, 18 months was, were uh, challenging for me. Most difficult 18 months. I remember it's been a really challenging time. So when I got here to the UK, I said, Lord, I need your perspective on what's been going on. And of course, the Lord said, well, you were called. You're called to London. That's the calling on your life. That's your vocation. That's the season you're in. And I had to make sure that a lot of things from the U.S. were, were no longer going to pull on you. So I removed a lot of things. Ow. But you get a kingdom perspective. All right, well, that's your perspective. I can have peace with this. Yeah, you weep, you cry, you miss people. You wish it wasn't that way. You know, I, I didn't go into Boston for 18 months. I went into Boston an hour, a couple hours before I left the country because some friends of mine from school were there and I haven't seen them for 10 years or five years or something. And they're dear friends and I want to spend time with them. And there was grace for that. And when I was there, the Lord said, I didn't want you to get reconnected to Boston. That's a kingdom perspective. The kingdom perspective. The Lord is never sentimental. People think that sentimentality is spiritual, but it's not. The Lord is never sentimental. You know, back in, uh, in, in Lent, excuse me, March 5th, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to start wearing your collar. And that was a really big deal. And I didn't want to do it because it just, there was so much unfinished business from the old, old days and history and bad things that had happened in my denomination breaking apart. And I just didn't want to do that. It took seven weeks for me to make the decision. But I did it because I'm obedient. Now that doesn't make me anything because you know there've been lots of times when I wasn't obedient. But whenever you're obedient, you're taking a king, choosing the kingdom perspective. And when you choose obedience, two things will happen. There will be grace to do it. And then you, it will bear fruit. So here's an interesting thing. This week I had a long talk with my mom in the airport about the collar. And it was a major healing conversation we had. Because all the, that happened with me in the church she felt the shame of that. She didn't use that language, but that's what was going on. And she said she was proud of it. 
you don't understand what God's calling you to do sometimes. But it's important to do it. And in order to do it, you have to have a kingdom perspective. You have to believe God's telling you to do something. It's going to mean something. It's going to matter. It's going to bear fruit. It's going to bear fruit. So the last story I wanted to share before I tell you some steps, I'm going to do this is, uh, so Susanna met me. It was so good to see Susanna. Oh my goodness. Uh, at the train station. So good to see someone who was happy to see me. Oh my goodness. And I, uh, yeah, so I, I got out of the train and there was Susanna with a big smile on her face. And we went and had coffee. And I looked down at my phone and I reached in my pocket for my glasses and there was nothing there. And I thought, uh-oh, uh-oh. And I knew that I had needed new glasses, but I was just, just avoiding it. And so uh, I couldn't read anything. So I, I, I said, oh dear, we have to find some new glasses before tomorrow. She said, why? And I said, because I haven't written my sermon yet. <laughs> <laughs> so while we'll fly blind, we'll do it for memory. But anyway, so I, uh, I said, well, what are we going to do? So I thought, well, we'll go find some place with my glasses. Well, we were sitting on a bench right in front of an eyeglass shop that promised an eye exam, new frames, lenses, all within an hour. It was three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. Oh, my gosh. And I said, only in London could you do this. And right before closing, I had new glasses. And found out that I was having problems, and and I what I had I've been having these terrible headaches that made me very very sick, and I was losing like days of work over it. So I went in to get my eye exam, and the eye doctor said to me, "Very first question." And I go to the eye doctor once a year, so I've been a few times, and I uh, went in. The very first question she asked me was, "Are you having?" Uh, are you having headaches that make you very, very sick? Very first question. Uh -huh. uh, how random is that? And I told her, and it was, there was an eye problem that was causing it. And so she was able to correct that with the new glasses. And so it was a big answer to prayer. Cause it was gonna, I was afraid it was gonna give me more trouble when I traveled. So, so sometimes God, uses the things that happen to us that seem terrible but then all of a sudden he brings order into it into the chaos so how do you get a kingdom perspective so when something when you hear a terrible thing you stop right then and there why are you looking <laughs> Susanna needs a Suzanne is nervous because she's the audience of one today. Um, so you her as an example in a sermon. But uh, you stop. You stop. First thing you do is you stop. And the stopping is really important. And all of you have heard me say this. because I, We've all either, I've either prayed with all of you one-on-one uh, -on -one or we've talked. You know, I put my hand on my heart right then in that moment of chaos. Whatever it is. And you say, you calm yourself. If you need to take a deep breath, you take a deep breath. And you say, Jesus, I am in you and you are in me. And then you say this out loud. I will choose to have a kingdom perspective right now. My emotions are not going to rule my life. I'm not going to go into panic mode. You have to make a decision and you have to say it out loud because you just have to override everything. And when you say it out loud, it activates things. And I'll tell you what I always say in that moment. There is always a solution. And then you're stopping. 
and then you say, God, what is your perspective right now? And then don't go into panic mode about praying. Just say, God, what is your perspective? I need a perspective right now. Ah! No, don't. You stay in that place of calm. You've got to stay in the place of calm and you just stand there. And if it takes you five minutes or an hour, if you don't know what to do next, don't do anything. And there'll always be someone there telling you to do something. There always will, because everyone else has an earthly perspective and they're freaking out. But you keep that, that kingdom perspective. I remember one time I was at the border in the UK and I wasn't sure if they were gonna let me in or not. And I was nervous. And I just calmed myself. I walked up to the gate and out of my mouth came word for word a, a paragraph from the UK immigration law. And the man smiled and said, welcome to the UK and open the gate. Whenever you're called to give count, the Holy Spirit will fill your mouth. That's what Jesus said. Keep an earthly or heavenly perspective, a kingdom perspective. When you have a kingdom perspective, you, it always results in wise decisions. And there's always long-term fruit. And that's what you want. You want fruit. So last week I preached on the Jesus sending out the 72. And he said to them, pray for the Lord of har the harvest to send for laborers into his fields because they were white unto harvest. Every day the, the mass readings for the daily readings have been Matthew's version of that same commissioning. So that was all repeated every day this week. And uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, I didn't have any money. Someone gave me a hundred dollar bill an hour before I left to fly. I put it in the bank and transferred it into my uh, account so I could turn it into pounds because I knew a hundred dollar bill would be no good to me at all when I got to London got out of the plane i had that it was turned out to be 89 pounds because the trend the pound was being shaken as well and checked my bank account in the u.s when i got to london and there was two dollars and fifty cents in the bank account so what do you do in that moment now you know, I have this rule that I always keep $200 in cash in my sock. So I left with no sock money. I was doing what the gospel lesson said. You take no purse. I had no purse. You take no purse. You take no lunch. You take nothing. I took nothing. I left. I left with nothing. Got here with nothing. Except for that 80 some pounds. And the Lord provided just enough to get by for each day. When I got, got here. So far, that's been the way it has been on this trip. Enough for each day. But there, there's fruit already. I've had more meaningful conversations on this the last four days than I had in the last year I had in the UK. <laughs> and uh, God has his plan. This is real. It's real. We have to have a kingdom perspective. If you read the news and you read the papers and you read the stock market, there's real cause for alarm, let's face it. There really is. But the kingdom, Rachel could quote this, the kingdom is always advancing, never retreating. The kingdom is always advancing. Do we go where Jesus wants us to go? We do what Jesus wants us to do. His way with his perspective. And God will, will take care of the rest. It's just amazing.
So Father, we ask you today to just write this on our hearts, that it would become our instinctual attitude, that we would come back into the kingdom, that we wouldn't be living in this world, but in your world, and all that we say and do. Thanks for listening to this week's message from Beth Harashim, The House of Artisans. If you would like to know more about Christian Otto and Belonging House Fellowship, please go to our website, belongginghouse.org.